I work at the University of Oxford as well, uh, but I also am the General Secretary for the British Islamic Medical Association, which is the representative body of Muslim doctors and healthcare professionals in the UK. <clears throat> this presentation is a very short presentation. We've been giving to different communities across the country, and it is already out of date. So what I'm telling you now is behind the curve, and, and, and Brother Tahir, inshallah, I just spoke to him, we'll be giving you the more up-to-date figures specifically for the Thames Valley and specifically for the Wickham area. So basically, we're just going to talk about what is coronavirus very briefly, why are we worried about it, why are we as a Muslim community particularly should be worried about it, and then also what we can do. And the main thing here is this is information. A lot of this may frighten you, and you may feel compelled to act in a certain way based on what I'm telling you, but this is purely for your information. The decision to what to do next lies with you as the imams, as the mosque leaders, as the community leaders. I must say that I'm not an expert in infectious diseases, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm a GP seeing patients on the front line, also connected with the Muslim Council of Britain, with the National Burial Council, and with the several hundred Muslim doctors that we have uh, in Bima working on the front line as well. This is the reason what's happening. And this is a picture taken uh, of the Mataf, and this is how we normally know it. This is es essentially what this disease is doing to our communities. Often people ask, isn't this just the flu? And this data here demonstrates that this is the mortality that you see by age for the normal flu, the common, uh, influenza. And you can see here, it's less than 1% across all age groups. In COVID-19, in the coronavirus, it's much higher, and particularly in the over 80 category, going up to 14.8%. This is data taken from Wuhan in China. Part of the reason is because the virus is such a virus that lays dormant for up to 14 days, whereas other viruses you can detect them quite easily. Someone with the coronavirus, COVID-19, could walk around, spread it around the community for two weeks, and you wouldn't know that they have this virus. That's what makes this virus particularly difficult to uh, tackle. And this is data as of, uh, well, as I said, it's already out of date. But <clears throat> you can see the cases are heading into six figures. As soon we causing much more. Uh, you can see most countries around the world have been affected. The mortality at the moment is 3.5%. So that is three, nearly three and a half people out of 100 who contract the disease will die from it. Versus 0.1%. That means that not even one person in 100 who gets the disease will die from it. One person in 1,000 who contracts influenza will die. This is Italy. This is basically what happened is uh, part of the reason why we're taking this a lot more seriously is because Italy was one of the first European countries to be affected by coronavirus. And in Italy, what we can see is actually the death rate is a lot higher. I gave these figures around um, of 14.5%. Uh, in Italy, as you can see, if you're over 90, you have a 22.7% chance of dying if you contract the disease. So you can see this is already a far more deadly disease. 7.2% is a fatality rate that's been reported in Italy, much higher than the global 3.5%. But on the other hand, most people who contract the disease will be fine. 80.9% of people who contract the disease will have mild symptoms. They can stay at home and they can manage. 13.8% will have severe symptoms and 4.7% will have critical symptoms will be in ITU. Other things to bear in mind is the fact that people who have long-standing health conditions, they're also at higher risk of fatalities. These are all fatal this is fatalities, okay? If you have high blood pressure or cardiovascular problems, 10% chance of dying, diabetes, 7%, chronic lung disease, smoking, COPD, 6.3%, uh, um, blood pressure alone, 6%, and cancer, 5.6%, no existing conditions, less than 1% chance. So basically, the headline figure is you're 35, 35 times more likely to die from COVID-19 than the flu. This is not the flu. Okay, That is the most important thing to understand. This is something that is particularly deadly to the elderly. One in six may die. To put that in context, every family member who contracts, every family unit that contracts this disease, one grandparent may die in that family. That's how serious this is. And these are potentially unprecedented times. And this here just gives you an indication of where we are behind the curve. So this is data plotted from different countries. China's far ahead, they're nearly 35 days ahead of everyone else. We're back here in the UK, and you can see here that, a date, that our trend is going up with this increase of 33% daily percentage increase. 
Um, just ignore these. Basically, this is to say that despite the measures that our country is taking, it's not doing enough to suppress the rate and, uh, and the, the way that this uh, disease is spreading in, in, in our country. Other countries, such as Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, and South Korea, have done much better to control the spread of the disease, and this is often by social measures, social isolation, such as isolating the elderly, strict quarantine rules, and uh, school closures. Uh, this is basically to say part of the messaging you will have seen from the government is around social isolation as to when this should be done. If you do not have any social isolation, every person that gets into contact with the disease will pass it on to up to three other people, and you'll see this exponential rise in the number of cases that are in society. However, if you introduce social distancing, that is that people do not contact one another, you can bring this curve to come down and you can reduce the amount of uh, prevalence of the disease up to 40%. <coughs> These are basically some slides as to what's been going on. So the new measures that have been announced today are essentially, uh, and yesterday, essentially my normal non-essential contact, working from home, restrictions on mass gatherings, uh, self-isolating, avoiding um, uh, socializing in, 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 in known areas, and to use the NHS only when you need to. And you can see other things have been suspended, such as the football uh, and other sporting events. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that mosques have also been implicated in spread of the disease. In Malaysia, uh, there have been quite a number of reports coming out from one large event held in one of the masajid. In Edinburgh, there's already been cases linked to a mosque as well. So again, something to bear in mind here is that we are following the trend that we've seen in Italy. As I said, up to 7.5% mortality from those people that contract this disease. The government strategy is changing daily. And if you compare it to other countries, it's questionable as to how effective it's being. And it's different to other countries, as I showed you, in East Asia, which are doing a little bit better, uh, at least the data suggests. And um, we need to do something about it. If you apply the data that I just showed to you to, um, to the Wickham community, we, we are a vulnerable community, and we have to look after ourselves first. Um, you know, we, we, you know, we have these problems. We live in extended families. How many of you go to visit your parents? Or how many of your grandchildren come and visit you? And how difficult is that for you to stop, to tell them to stay away from me? And what stigma is that attached upon you as a person and you as a family if you don't go visit your grandparents, go and visit your parents? So these are the sorts of things that we need to think about. And, you know, these are basically the sorts of things that not just in the masjid, in our community, we need to think about stopping. So I was just about to shake the brother's hand as I walked in. And he very... You know, cleverly he did the Ayvalla, the the Urtugul uh, Salam. These are the sorts of things that we, as community leaders, as doctors, as faith leaders, as imams, we need to be at the forefront of encouraging our community to be doing. Because if they see us not returning the salam, they will not be doing the salam in their own family. Because these are the sorts of things that delay the spread of the virus. The longer we can delay the spread, the better it will be for people like uh, Dr. Tahir in the ITU, where they don't have to uh, put up with the massive demand of the 18 beds that they have. If all of us suddenly got ill, that's the whole ITU capacity for this region gone. So what we need to do is try and delay that spread. So these are the other things that we need to do. Basically, what this will do is prevent this surge from happening. It means that the virus slowly from, uh, goes across our societies. Now, this is where the problem lies, because right now, I'm pretty sure most of you have probably got an idea in your mind as to what needs to happen. But the problem is that you're going to get bored. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to lose the will to continue. But we have to maintain the course, because if we don't, you're going to see a pipe spike go up like this. And so we also need to think about how can we maintain and how can we keep the morale of our community and how can we make things uh, viable? How can we make sure that the community survives, particularly the elderly, particularly the vulnerable? And we need to think about things like for, the, for our madrasas and how do we do things like virtual education for our children? We need to think, think about things like janaza arrangements. Ramadan is coming up, Tarawi is coming up. These sorts of things the community need to be prepared for from now so that when the time comes, we don't end up in trouble uh, with them and indeed ourselves. I just want to quickly share the things that we've done. So these, this is something that we put out on the 12th of March, and this is, that is now five days ago. And five days ago, we talked to massages across the country about this is very likely this is coming. When this came out, there's still a lot of pushback from massages. So why are we doing this, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, we talked about things like, you know, avoiding attending, et cetera, et cetera, um, and so on. Only today, uh, sorry, yesterday, we released this letter. So it's not just me and, uh, and Dr. Tahir. Over 200 Muslim doctors, part of BIMA and more, have written a letter saying that we need to take urgent action to suspend all congregational activity in Masajid. 
And furthermore, the Muslim Council of Britain yesterday also issued a statement recommending that masajids suspend uh, their congregational activities as well. So in summary, what we need to do is we need to be proactive, we need to avoid panic, and we need to make sure whatever we do, we're doing it the same across the region because it's nothing is more damaging than one community saying, well, why are they doing it and why are we not doing it? And where possible, if we can all be on the same page, that will be in tremendously helpful in making sure that what we do is in the best interest of our community. Jazakumullah khair. Apologies, I know the presentations took a long time.